Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ali Mastardo, Senior Association Manager with PPRA. Thank you for joining us for the Dam Roads Still Need Fixing webinar. We do have you all on mute and we'll be using the chat function located on your screen for any questions. We will answer all questions at the end of the webinar. Um, we would like to introduce today's moderator, John Rathman of Cutler Repaving. John is a 1977 graduate of the University of Kansas and has been with Cutler Repaving for 43 years. John says the only thing he has done longer than recycle asphalt is being married to his wife, Kathy, for 45 years. John is an era past president and vice president of the Foundation of Pavement Preservation. He currently serves as an, on the advisory board for the National Center of Pavement Preservation. John, I will now turn it over to you. All right, Allie. Um, thanks a lot and welcome, everybody. I think we've got some record turnout today for this uh, compared to the webinar that we did last year. Um, I'm really excited about this. We have a first-rate group of panelists that are joining us this afternoon that have a wide range of experience advocating for transportation infrastructure, both legislatively and technically. All three have walked the walk in the transportation arena. And this afternoon, you will hear their ideas on how, on how to fix the damn roads. And more importantly, what happens if we don't? Our goal is to keep this to about an hour with their presentations totaling about 30 to 40 minutes, leaving the remainder of the time for Q&A. You can direct your questions to me in the chat box and I will hold them in, until the final Q&A. Just a couple of things that you should know. There are some really good resources that are available for your use. There is a link to the FP2 website that will allow you to download a toolkit that will help you organize a congressional visit to your plant or job site once this current pandemic is has passed. There's also a link to a letter urging your elected representatives to act, as well as a link to help you find your elected representatives and senator and their contact information. As always, Tracy Taylor with Alignment Government Strategies is available to help you if you have questions. Her link is also provided uh, as well as Jim Malthrop's F2 address. So there's a lot of really good things out there for us today. We've got we've got some people that know um, what they're talking about today and I think you're going to find that's going to be very interesting. So with that as a backdrop I'm going to introduce our first panelist Ricky uh, Rocky Moretti. Rocky is the Director of Policy and Research for TRIP, also known as the Road Information Program, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit that prepares reports on a variety of transportation issues, including traffic congestion, traffic safety, road and bridge conditions, transportation planning, and air quality. Rocky's been with TRIP since 1992, where he writes and edits numerous state and national reports and is often cited by local and national media in numerous transportation stories. So with that as the backdrop, Rocky, please take us away. Thank, thank you, John. And, and thanks for this opportunity to, uh, to talk to everyone. Uh, it's really a, you know, a, a particularly critical juncture for, for transportation, certainly for surface transportation in terms of, of, of how we move forward and what some of the challenges are. Uh, Trip in, in, in my role as, as policy director and research director is, is always keeping an eye on all of the latest data across the country uh, at, at the state and federal level, at the local level in terms of the condition of the transportation system, what's happening uh, in terms of, of traffic congestion, how it's impacting the economy, uh, what's happening with trucking. Uh, and, and by putting those reports out and, and, and until the last month, being able to, to travel across the country and, and, and doing the research and putting the reports out, uh, it really helps us get a, a good sense of, of what's happening. So as we move forward uh, through these slides, if, if you uh, look at the next slide, just looking at, at what some of the latest trends are, um, the first obvious is, is, is growth. The, continue, the, the country continues to grow at, at really a, an astonishing rate over the next 20 years approximately another 60 million people uh, are going to be in the United States. Now, uh, obviously, you, you have to look at that geographically. Uh, the, the greatest growth uh, clearly is in the South and in the West, although there is continued growth in, in the Midwest 
uh, and also the Northeast, uh, but regionally the challenges are different. Uh, when we do a lot of our, our projects at the state level, obviously in, in areas with fast growth, it's, it's accommodating that growth, uh, trying to keep uh, the transportation system functioning. Uh, as you get into some of the uh, northeastern and, and midwestern states, there is continued growth, but typically they also have older infrastructure, uh, oftentimes challenging weather conditions. So you've got differing challenges uh, really across the country. Um, after the 2008 uh, Great Recession, essentially vehicle travel leveled off for about five years. And, and there was a lot of speculation this was the new normal, that travel would not be increasing anymore. Um, but, but as you would expect, it really had more to do with the economy. And as the economy uh, regained its health, we started to see travel increasing at about one and a half percent a year. And, and that's very critical because uh, when a lot of the, the, the analysis is done of future transportation needs, they're oftentimes projecting much lower travel growth. But what we've seen uh, consistently over the previous six years uh, was that travel was increasing at a level on the higher end of what expectations are. That's critical because obviously that means a lot more private vehicles, a lot more commercial trucks out there on the system. It's obviously a good sign economically, um, but it also has significant implications on keeping the performance of the system up, keeping it safe, and keeping it well maintained. Now, at the end, we'll talk and begin a conversation in terms of, of obviously uh, the impacts of this pandemic. I, I think to a large extent, uh, a lot remains to be seen, but we'll, we'll, we'll bring that into the conversation shortly. Excuse me. We also did a report last year looking at freight transportation across the country. Again, very vital uh, to the country's economy. Uh, what the report found is that the, the need for freight was actually accelerating as we moved into really a different type of supply chain management where the, the public wanted packages smaller and quicker and faster and the expectations were increasing and, and we saw sort of the Amazon effect where distribution centers were, were being built across the country uh, and more and more pressure uh, to move uh, more and more transportation and small packages, which very much uh, tend to work better in trucking because of its flexibility. And so as we point out in, in the, the, our report that the value of freight over the next 25 years is expected to double, uh, that's controlled for inflation. If you look just at weight, those numbers are, are somewhat lower, but the bottom line is, is, is that there's a lot of trucks out there as you can see in this, this next slide here, uh, a chart from uh, the Federal Highway Administration. This shows currently, if you look at the, the charts in red, uh, which segments, these are for the most part interstate systems, uh, are carrying uh, the, the highest levels of over 8,500 trucks a day and, and where the ADT or the average travel, uh, about a quarter of the trucks, if you look at the, at the ones in, in yellow, uh, our vehicles on those interstates are, are trucks. And so those routes give you some sense of, of, of just the significant level uh, of truck travel that's out there. Uh, again, absolutely vital to the country, but uh, a real challenge on, on an aging interstate system. The interstate system 64 years old, so, so next year it, it theoretically is eligible for Medicare. Um, but, but I don't think retirement's an option for the interstate system. So um, there's a huge challenge in, in addressing that. Uh, the, the next slide, we start to look at some of the key data that uh, we've reported in different reports or, or, or we're analyzing. Uh, the, the, the top one is overall pavement conditions, and that's even with a third of urban roads in poor condition, uh, it's actually a bit of a misnomer because that's looking at pavement smoothness. Uh, and that's obviously to the public, that's what they care about. They want to be out there on smooth roads, uh, but, but any transportation practitioner knows that that's just the, 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 you know, the tip of the iceberg. A smooth road uh, is absolutely vital, but uh, it's also just as vital that the sub bases under that highway or, or road are also in good condition. Uh, as increasingly, uh, we've got road surfaces where the sub bases are over 50 or 60 years old. Uh, what we're finding is, is that uh, state and local governments press for funding, uh, continue to put the overlays because they want to keep the, the system in, in relatively rideable condition. 
uh, but they're not really approaching the, the far more critical need ultimately to re reconstruct what's underneath those road surfaces. And so, uh, again, the numbers have gotten somewhat worse in the last few years, uh, but I think what uh, keeps transportation uh, agencies uh, up at night is knowing that they can only do that for so long because what's underneath it uh, is really crumbling. The, the same goes for bridges. We've seen a, uh, a consistent and positive reduction in bridges that are structurally deficient, uh, but at the same time, uh, you, you're getting to a point where, where nearly half of those bridges are at least 50 years old, uh, and, and bridges built 50 and 60 years ago didn't, didn't have the technology or the type of materials that we have today, uh, and, and the recognition is, is that those numbers uh, are somewhat misleading because you have a huge need to rebuild uh, a lot of the bridges out there. Uh, traffic fatalities continue to go up. Uh, we saw a slight decrease in 2019. May maybe the newer vehicle technology is starting to help us a bit, uh, but we've got a, a long way to go in terms of addressing those needs. Uh, and, and 16 out of the world's most congested urban areas uh, are here in the United States. Uh, if we go on, uh, TRIPS estimated what the costs are in the next slide of those deficiencies. Uh, annually, we look at what it costs to drive on rough roads, which is beating up your vehicles, uh, and we estimate that that's more than $600 per driver. Now that's not just the money you spend when you go to get, get your car fixed or get a repair. Uh, it looks at the depreciation on a vehicle. Uh, if you buy a vehicle and hope it's gonna last for 10 years and you're driving on roads in pretty tough condition, maybe you only get eight or nine years out of that vehicle. Well, that's a huge economic cost. And, and, and we estimate that's around $130 billion annually our, our argument, obviously, is, is that there's a cost to have infrastructure in good condition, but a, a far more heavier one if you don't make the repairs. Uh, the next number is the Texas Transportation Institute. They look at uh, what is the, the cost of those delays, and, and I, I think they, they value people's time at, at around $20 an hour. I think most people would actually think their time's worth far more than that. Uh, but again, it, it does give you, it does monetize to some extent that there's a cost in not having the system that you need out there in terms of, of reliability. Uh, and then we take a look at that uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates the economic cost of traffic crashes. So obviously not the emotional, not, not the, the costs that really are unmeasurable, but just strictly economic costs, lost productivity, uh, lost, you know, someone lost from the economy, hospitalization costs, uh, and then we, based on a variety of research, estimate that about a third of those fatal crashes, the lack of adequate roadway safety features didn't cause the crash, didn't cause the fatality, but the lack of a rumble strip, the lack of good lighting, um, the lack of good intersection design or a turn lane contributed to the, the, the consequences of, of that uh, vehicle crash. Uh, we estimate that cost alone is around $100 million. And then the AAA Safety Foundation uh, did a, an incredible report two years ago where they looked at all of the projects that are needed across the country to make the roadway system more forgiving and safer, uh, what it would cost, and then how many lives it would save. And, and what they found is, is every billion dollars spent on a needed highway project in 20 years would send you, save you about 440 lives uh, and 7,600 serious traffic crashes. Uh, the bottom line is, uh, when you invest in traffic safety, you save lives. Uh, if, if we go ahead to uh, uh, the next slide here, um, we look the, the condition of performance report uh, that's provided to Congress by the Department of Transportation estimates that that the current backlog of needed road repairs is over 400 billion, over 100 billion for bridges, and the cost to expand the system is over 200 million or billion. And when you add that to AAA's uh, report on what's needed to make the roads as safe as they should be, it gets you to almost a trillion dollars. Uh, tremendous needs out there. Uh, and then finally, and I'll, and I'll just sort of touch on this uh, because I think we're all trying to figure this out. And, and it's, it's it, you know, I, I think it will take a while to truly understand how this is going to change America's transportation system. But one thing is clear, we're seeing this huge drop in, in traffic. Uh, started, you know, started in March, it will probably continue uh, for several more months. Um, and AASHTO is estimating that the lost revenue, because obviously people are, are not uh, uh, 
spending as much money on motor fuels, they're not, not paying those taxes, they're not using toll roads as much. Over the next 18, 18 months, it's going to be around $50 billion. Um, a tremendous impact, obviously. Uh, I saw that Missouri a few days ago cut some lettings because of, of reduced revenue. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, unless that $50 billion in lost state revenue can be picked up. And, and without that funding, all of the challenges that I've discussed previously are not going to be addressed and will actually get far worse. Um, and, you know, and we've seen obviously some, some impacts on, on, on environmentally and on safety. Uh, but, but again, that's not the, the way to address those issues. Uh, and we all know that. So uh, there's going to be a huge challenge to, to keep the transportation uh, a community whole uh, coming up, uh, and 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 really, uh, the country's going to need an excellent transportation system to 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 allow itself to to recover from from what we've gone through the last two months. Thank you. All right, Rocky. Um, very enlightening, and I appreciate you guys keeping us right on schedule there. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. J. Richard Willis with Napa. Um, uh, Richard sent me his, uh, his bio and, and I have to read it like he sent it to me because uh, in this pandemic, I think it's rather interesting. He's a father of uh, three children, uh, father of a nine-year-old who has already realized that you can make a living doing YouTube videos, a seven-year-old girl who thinks everything in life needs more glitter, and a three-year-old son who has not seen Jurassic Park and thus can't understand why dinosaurs would not make good pets. To support his uh, love for his family and good food, Richard is Vice President for Engineering, Research, and Technology for the National Asphalt Payment Association, where he assists the asphalt industry with issues related to recycled materials, including RAP, RAS, and RTE, and asphalt mixtures. So Richard, please uh, enlighten us. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of this uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, I'm taking a little different approach as we're going through this topic today and really thinking about um, Rocky set the stage on what's going on and really the urgency that's out there. And I'm really focusing more on what happens if we don't make a change? What happens if everything continues to kind of remain status quo? Um, or what happens if we just continue um, to kick this can down the road a little bit further? And so as we look at this, um, I kind of ask the question, something's gonna have to give. So what gives or what happens if highway funding just continues the way it is right now? Um, for those of you who aren't aware of who NAPA is, we represent the asphalt um, pavement contractors and material suppliers throughout the country. Our vision and mission are on the slide um, but really our mission is to support, to advocate, and to advance the asphalt pavement industry. And right now, the, we are in a high time of advocating for the needs and services that um, the asphalt pavement industry provides. If you look at our strategic goals, um, I'm typically more in long, I typically focus more on the safeguard, longevity, and growth, um, and advanced quality innovation. But today, we're really focusing on this third one, which was it's the national advocacy and smart regulations and trying to help people understand why we need to take this seriously and why we need to act right now. So I'm gonna try something that's a, a little bit different. Um, well, I was going to try something. We're starting to have an error on the screen. Um, but what I was going to do, there we go. Um, the first thing I've always been told is to know your audience when you're speaking to someone. And so today I want to find out a little bit more about who you are. So if you, you'll you take out your cell phones and text to the number 22333, the word asphalt one, it's going to give you the option to come in. And I want to say one word which best describes what you do for work. Now that could be, you could say government, you could say contractor, you could say lobbyist, you could say uh homeschool teacher at the moment because a lot of us are having to do that but trying to understand what we are and what we're doing i think is important now this may have been an epic fail because again i'm seeing an error so we'll tr let's try this um second 
actually this one's not working as well. So I'll just continuing on um, with part of the conversation. Sorry about that. Sometimes when you try to use new technology, it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I'll ask you to think about this question right now then. What do these two things have in common? The movie, The Fugitive, and the song, I Can't Help Falling in Love With You by UB40. Well, besides saying there are two things that haven't aged well, both of these were number one in America the last time Congress did anything to raise more money for highway transportation, including <laughs> the gas tax. And if you look at it, all you have to think about is look at the picture of Harrison Ford in The Fugitive and Google the movie The Call of the Wild, and you will see that some time has passed between these. It's been a while. We're now, in the, instead of listening to UB40, people are listening to Cardi B and all kinds of other people. And so since so, so long has gone, since we've done anything to really help or to move construction funding along, something eventually has to give. And the first thing that I think about as representing an industry is I think about our workforce. If you think about the last couple of years, our industries have really been ramping up our workforce efforts, trying to recruit more people into the industry, trying to make sure that we are giving people uh, great salaries, great opportunities to make a living. And if, if you look at some recent statistics, there are about 343,000 people that work in the road construction industry. Now, that does not include people like your equipment manufacturers. It doesn't include some of the material suppliers. These are actually boots on the ground, people working in the industry, building our roads, managing those offices, um, practicing legal or law for those companies. We have a lot of people. And one of the things that's great about what's going on right now is we're still hiring. If you look at a lot of social media posts that are out there right now, we have construction companies and, and other organizations that are trying to bring more people into this industry as other people lose their jobs. It's an opportunity to really secure the future workforce for our industry. But if funding doesn't come through, what's going to happen? Are we gonna be able to continue to keep up that pace? Are we gonna be able to continue to keep these people and, and give these people the promises that we have when we pull them into our industry? The second thing that I think gives when it comes to postponing highway funding is our economy. And this is something that's on everyone's mind right now. There was a 2018 report um, for congressional reporting that a research that said the largest short-term gains in GDP will likely be achieved from funds that were spent during a recession and the investments focused on core infrastructure, which is roads, bridges, and railways. That's something we can do right now. Um, there was another report that was put out by AGC called the pivotal role of federal infrastructure investment in our economy. And they quoted FHWA saying that every dollar invested in the nation's highway generated about 30 cents of production cost savings per year to businesses over the life of the improvement, generally exceeding the initial investment in four years. These are some opportunities and these are some ways to plug into the economy right now to help us in this time. But there's more than just that. When we work with our DOTs, when we work with our road owners, we have to think about their partnership. And right now, they don't have peace of mind about the future. They, you heard Rocky say that right now they're looking at maybe a $50 billion shortfall because of people not being on the roads. Well, beyond that, they don't know what kind of funding is coming for them in their future. So we can help support them by encouraging, giving them a long range plan to finance their roads and plan into the future. But then I also think about our industry, the people that are actually out there building, maintaining, preserving our roads. And I think about the longer we wait, the harder our work becomes, the more difficult it, it becomes to actually build the type of roads that we want to. I've heard a lot of DOTs talk about, um, well, we're not getting the quality of materials that our quality of mixtures or quality of materials that we were getting in the past. And there's sometimes that may be the case, but I think there are other times when it's not necessarily the quality of the materials, it's just we're not building on quality products. Instead of doing a treatment early on in the life to keep a pavement in good condition, we're applying that same treatment that should have been done in good condition when it is 
10 years down the road and it really can't do what it's designed to do. And it's kind of like my three-year-old son's guide to medicine. You could have a, you could have a scrape, you put a Band-Aid on it. You could have a concussion, you put a Band-Aid on it. You have a compound fracture, you put a Band-Aid on it. And instead of looking at what do I really need to do to ensure that we are giving our riding public the best roads possible, we don't have the money to do that. And this is an opportunity for us to get out of the, the Band-Aid business and ensure that as an industry or as industries, we can provide the solutions that our partners need to make sure that the roads get done the way they're supposed to get done all the time. Because the longer we let our roads deteriorate, the more work it takes to get them functioning again, the more money it takes to get them functioning again. So in order to fix the problem of road condition, we've got to fix the funding mechanism. We've got to provide solutions with that. And with that, thank you again for allowing me to be on this. And I'll look forward to having some questions with you later on. All right, thank you, Richard. Uh, I'll, I'll just remind everybody that's watching that if you do have a question, send it to me in the uh, in the chat box and uh, we'll make sure that we get those, those answered at the end. Um, our, our last speaker that's gonna try to tie all this together, and I know uh, she'll do it, is Laura Parada. Laura is the president and CEO of the American Highway Users Alliance. And it's a nonprofit 501c6 advocacy organization serving as the united voice of the transportation community in the United States, promoting safe, uncongested highways and enhanced freedom of mobility. Prior to joining the highway users, she was the senior director of legislative affairs for the National Automobile Dealers Association. Laura has a BA in political science and began her career on Capitol Hill in 2001, working for New York Congressman Amo Houghton. So she knows her way around the hill and uh, we're gonna see what her uh, suggestions are gonna be for fixing the damn roads. Laura, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Um, really honored to be here today. I can't figure out how to get our pictures up top, so I guess you'll just have to look at, at my slides. I apologize. <laughs> well, I'm really honored to be here. Again, I'm Laura Parada with American Highway Users Alliance. Um, this is, um, our organization is uh, made up of 300 members. We are a coalition, a C6, um, and basically we're a very broad coalition of folks who care about um, fixing and maintaining our, our roadways, getting robust funding, and um, really affecting transportation policy. And in, in we have affected transportation policy since the very beginning of our organization's creation back in 1932. Um, we have members everywhere from the construction um, industry, the roadway industry, uh, materials industry, the automakers, trucking, uh, AAA clubs, very broad uh, stakeholders. So um, we are just really excited about having this opportunity to be with you today. And I wanna talk a little bit about the legislative perspective on what's going on and um, really what we can see happening on Capitol Hill going forward. Uh, so kind of where is the money gonna come from? Uh, that's what I hope to help at least outline what we're hearing. So I wanted to take a look back before COVID, kind of what was happening on transportation reauthorization. Back last summer of 2019, uh, there was S2302, uh, it was a Senate bill, um, bipartisan, written by the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee that had robust funding, a 27% increase for highways, um, $287 billion over five years. And that, again, passed unanimous consent last summer. Um, and, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Chairman Barrasso and his efforts on this in a minute. Um, then on the other side, um, in the House, we've had the framework that was released at the end of January of this year, $319 billion for highways over five years. Now, this was just a framework. There, were no, there was no bill text at the time of release. Um, and it did, um, one thing of note I do want to mention is that it did slightly shift the split between the highways and transits, which has traditionally been 80-20 to 75-24. This does seem to be a trend that we're seeing, um, especially from the House's advocacy on where they might want to be heading. Um, and, you know, this is just something we want to be aware of. Uh, and then finally, 
Uh, we have had Trump's budget with an $810 billion surface transportation reauthorization proposal over 10 years. Just to compare this to um, the Senate to the um, Senate bill from uh, that I just talked about, S2302, um, it is about $13.9 billion less than the Senate proposal. So it works out to be about $273.3 billion a year. So all of this obviously is very fluid, um, but currently the transportation authorization is set to expire on September 30th. So that is right around the corner. It's um, you know just about five months now. So it is really creeping up fast. And then on top of that, um, we do have the Senate Commerce and the Senate Finance Committee having to work on their titles from the Senate perspective, because we just had the Environment and Public Works Committee um, piece move. And um, but Chairman Barrasso with the Environment and Public Works Committee really wants to move this as soon as possible and has been trying to push to get this um, his bill to become part of COVID relief, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then with the House timing of their bill has been very fluid. Um, I had heard from TNI that there was a possibility for, for some sort of movement in June, but I do think all of this is going to be um, tied to how COVID relief and recovery moves forward. So obviously COVID changed absolutely everything. Um, we have had now 3.5 phases of relief to date. Uh, phase one back at the beginning of March, $8 billion um, really to help prevent the spread of the disease. Uh, phase two was $192 billion um, focused on, you know, a lot on testing. And then we've had phase three, which was a very big $2 trillion um, package on March 27th that, you know, sent checks to every American. Uh, included hospital grants, small business loans, but there was also some transportation money, but it was really focused on transit, aviation, and Amtrak. There was $150 included in this to state and local governments, um, but so there's a possibility that some of that could go to DOTs, but the way everything's bleeding right now, um, you know, much, much more needs to be done to shore up our entire nation. And then we've had um, Phase 3.5, which the House is working on this very day for $484 billion, small business loans, money for hospitals, and more money for testing. So we're looking at about a little over $2.5 trillion in relief since March 6th for our nation. So I have to say this is a very, very different environment than what we had just a couple months ago. Um, and it's something that we really, really need to, you know, realize that now I know that a minor, majority leader McConnell, sorry, in the Senate is talking about uh, putting his foot on the brake now as far as this relief money, because from his perspective, um, you know, the country is, is just digging a hole of debt. Uh, so it's going to be this balancing act between, you know, what tr President Trump's going to push for, because he keeps talking about infrastructure on a very positive note. Um, what Pelosi is going to be focusing on and what the Senate's going to be allowing to go forward. And then we have an election year on top of everything else. So this is an extremely tricky tightrope that everyone's walking. As far as the infrastructure debate and COVID relief, um, there was a period of time when there was a big rush that, you know, phase four could be infrastructure focused um, for actually it might have at the time been phase three. Uh, but and there was talk of a two trillion dollar infrastructure package. Um, but I would just say that really, as I mentioned, the timing is just totally uncertain, and it all depends on the quarantine's length and damage, which right now is very much unknown. Um, if this keeps dragging on, some of the states, you know, what are they going to have to do? McConnell's talking about them filing for bankruptcy. This is um, going to be a very uh, tough dynamic. But that being said, we have to position infrastructure and highway investment as something that's absolutely needed for our country to recover. I mean, that's the message we have to be bringing home. So COVID recovery uh, should focus on infrastructure from the highway user's perspective. There's uh, obviously massive needs, you know, according to the US DOT's um, performance report, there's a $786.4 billion backlog of highway and bridge investment. And uh, I think that this is really the time to request that as part of long-term recovery, we have to be in investing in a long-term highway bill. I mean, that is a route to absolute um, way to invest in our country and in, in jobs and in something that our country so desperately needs as far as from a safety perspective and from an economic perspective. 
We also really, really need reliable funding for the Highway Trust Fund, and, and obviously state revenue needs to be short up, as was already mentioned. You know, the state DOTs are asking for $50 billion in emergency re relief, and I think it's absolutely going to be needed. Uh, the highway users did send a letter up to the Hill in support of that effort, and I know a lot of other organizations have done the same. Um, this is a time Congress needs to hear, you know, the squeakiest wheel is going to get the oil in this situation, and they absolutely need to hear how, how detrimental this is. I mean, I've been on the calls with Ashto where they're saying, you know, some states are, you know, as you know, canceling work, they're uh, delaying work, and they're worried about just being able to pay their employees. So this is a very, situa very serious situation. I think one of the messages we do want to bring home is that this, this should be part of recovery, investing in and that money and the DOTs to help them, and then also in a long-term infrastructure bill, because this is about jobs that can be continued because they're classified as essential. They can be done outside in the open air and with proper social distancing in place. So what I really hope to leave you with is that we'd hope that you take action You know, today. Uh, Congress absolutely needs to hear from you. And I know they're not here in, in DC, except for this week they were here for this vote, but generally they're back home, but they're dying to talk and interact with constituents. Because again, this is an election year, to mention that again. And then on top of that, we have um, a very um, crazy situation where politicians who are the most social beasts are locked inside their house. So this is the time to interact. They need to hear how important this is to our industry, to the transportation world, and to every American's safety and ability to get to work. So um, you really have to, I'd say emailing is the best, most effective way, unless you have a legislator's cell phone number or um, you can get a hold of them that way. But definitely emails the way to communicate. Um, you need to paint your story. You know, why is pavement preservation, why should it be a priority? Talk about, you know, the, the great story you have that, about how it's sustainable, about how there's great return on investment. I mean, this is the time to, to paint your picture of why this is a good choice on how to spend our limited resources. And then also, you know, just explaining the need for the long-term bill as part of recovery, because just as, uh, you know, the New Deal and, and FDR focused on um, rebuilding or building our infrastructure during a very difficult time for our nation, this is like no other, the same situation. We have massive needs. We have um, an opportunity to make an investment that will improve our economy and and do good things to get people working, especially folks who might have been just you know um, displaced workers. We can um, fill them with a new role that um, is very much in need. We also just to reference that was something that was mentioned earlier on FP2's website. There are links to be able to uh, figure out how to invite a member of Congress to your facility. So we'd really encourage you to do that. And then also, you know, sending letters is very important right now too. So send emails, send letters, all this, this is the time to act. So I hope um, this was helpful and I will turn it back over. All right, thank you, Laura. Um, I'll just also remind everyone that there are three downloads plus find your Congressman sites that are available on the homepage of uh, fp2.org. So, um, you know, please make yourself uh, aware of that and uh, hit that uh, website up. We, we put all that on there just so you'd be able to go on there and get that information. And then there's also a link uh, to Tracy's email. If you have questions uh, about how to put this all together, you can email her and um, she will definitely um, get back with you and help you um, uh, answer those questions. And we've, we've had several questions, so let me uh, page through some of these. Um, all right, this this one there were had several of them from uh, there were several at the beginning from from uh, Tracy, uh, and her interest was the fact that she's heard that agencies are finishing projects ahead of schedule. Uh, how will decreasing revenues impact projects next year as uh, projects are being finished ahead of schedule this year? Anybody want to take a shot at that? How will decreasing revenues impact uh, projects uh, in 2021? Well, certainly states are, are you know, we're, we're starting to let a number of projects, but they, they, they certainly have to look at, at their cash flow. And they were obviously coming into this year anticipating 
uh, you know, in terms of a fuel taxes is similar to the previous year. And, and so we're starting to see them, you know, pulling back on, on lettings for projects that we're moving forward. We've also heard that, that in terms of the traffic mitigation uh, necessities because of the lower traffic, they've been able to reduce that somewhat. And, and so, so you would anticipate that would speed up some projects, but, but we've seen in previous times when, when they were up against a, a federal program that was set to expire, uh, they do what people do logically when, when revenues in question, they, they start to pull back on projects uh, and they have that responsibility uh, you know, to their state to not obviously make commitments they can't keep. Uh, and so you would expect them to be quite conservative in this environment. Are, are any of uh, the panelists uh, hearing how payment preservation can help uh, solve some of these problems? John, I have heard a little bit. Um, I was in the last question. Um, I've heard some states are, are getting projects done about two weeks early, some, some areas. That's what they're averaging. However, while projects are ending early, I know some states have talked about um, they've had challenges with all the exploratory work and background work that's required to get a new major project ready. Um, that would that really um, would be like your, your geotechnical surveys, all the surveying that was involved, um, maybe purchase of right away just because of the stay at home orders, the social distancing, um, to get all those things done. It's not making them where they're not happening, it's just slowing down their efficiency a little bit. Because of that, it may be pushing some of the larger construction projects into the future. And so they may be turning to some more pre uh, pavement preservation um, techniques as alternatives to those larger projects to kind of do their to use their federal share over the course of this year. I guess I direct this question maybe to Richard or to any of the other panelists, but is it, in your opinion, do you think there's a disconnect with elected officials understanding that fixing deteriorated roads also increases uh, or can increase employment? Um, I gotta remember I'm being recorded on this. Um, <laughs> I, I think, uh, let me put it this way. I think there's a lot of education that our, the, the whole road construction industry can do. Um, we've, been, we've actually been doing a lot of um, research over the past year about just um, perceptions related to the road construction industry in general and what people think about it as a way um, to continue recruiting people into the industry. But we got a lot of interesting information out of it regarding just what does the general public typically think about it? And when they started understanding that this is an industry that provides thousands of jobs to Americans, um, especially now at a time when um, jobs um, that people can do outdoors and be out on every day um, is something that we can't take for granted anymore. Um, it's definitely something that changed people's minds about, and perception and made them think a lot more positively about the industry. Um, it, in fact, it was one of the highest rated things on just pe what, how people thought about the industry. And so I think that there is an education that needs to take place with not just, um, not just as we continue to help a legislators understand um, the industry better, but I think the general public as well. Um, because right now, one of the things that we, we can do to help change the perception of the public is be out there practicing those safety measures um, that are being put out by OSHA um, so that people can see, hey, we're an industry that takes even safety seriously. Um, and I think that that will go a long way. Anybody else want to take a shot at that? Rocky, Laura? If not, I got some other questions here, so. Well, I, you know, the um, thing I was just going to point, point out is, is that certainly, you know, we saw it 10 years ago after the, the, the significant recession, that the ability to create jobs become, becomes a greater priority. And as Richard pointed out, a lot of the jobs, uh, particularly in, in the service sector, that are gonna be really marginalized for, for the foreseeable future, at least, at least, at least reduced, um, certainly infrastructure and transportation construction uh, is an area that, that can be done within, within the limitations 
of social distancing. And, and so uh, and we also know that, that for every job created uh, within the transportation community, there's one job created in the general public. So it does become very attractive, I think, politically as a way to really move the economy forward. But, th but then I think beyond that, ultimately, we have to make the case, which is accurate, that it, it's beyond the initial project. It, what's that, what happens once that project's done and you have a more efficient system, you have businesses working more productively, you have people safer. Um, ultimately, that is what drives transportation investment. Okay, uh, here's a question from uh, one of the webinar participants. Um, I guess this would probably be directed to you, Rocky. Uh, so if a billion will save 440 million li 440 lives, can we say that funding cut will kill 22,000 people, if not more. Well, it, it, you know, if you look at, at that report, it lays out the types of projects that are needed. You know, everything from, from paving shoulders to adding rumble strips to adding lighting. Uh, so it, if it is money taken away from projects that have safety uh, as a critical component, then certainly uh, when you don't do safety projects, uh, you're exposing people to more risk. Okay. Um, here's a question from another uh, webinar participant. Uh, can we make uh, electric cars pay prepay into the highway trust fund um, at a time a time of purchase, like uh, maybe a thousand dollars a car, and then index index that fee into the future? I'm happy to take this one. Um, I would say that that's definitely coming down the road and some of the states are already starting to tax uh, registration for electric vehicles. So I think there's no question that everyone agrees that eventually all electric vehicles need to be paying in. It's just a matter of the timing. You know, there's um, kind of counter opposing issues right now because you have electric vehicles that are putting wear and tear on the road. But at the same time, the government's putting tremendous pressure on the automakers to build out these electric vehicles and make a certain percentage of their fleets electric um, so that their mix will meet fuel economy standards. So um, it, it's a real tightrope right now between incentivizing the purchase of EVs and um, also making sure you're capturing the wear and tear they're putting on the roadways. So I think eventually everyone agrees that they're going to end up paying in. It's just a matter of timing and the Congress having the political will of when they're going to do things like levy a federal tax on electric vehicles. Okay. Um, I, haven't, I haven't seen any more questions pop up here, so I, I've got some questions for, for you guys. Um, Laura, um, you know, what kind of problems might the transit funding that you talked about on one of your slides, well, I think it was in the House bill, cause uh, in obtaining maybe passage of this bill. I know there were some people who still uh, were unhappy that a piece of uh, transit funding went into the last, uh, when we when we last uh, raised the gasoline tax in 93. Um, so what kind of problems do you think maybe some folks might see that we're funding transit through this that, that maybe might become an impediment to pass passage? Yeah, you know, it's just been this creep where um, the the needs for transit are, you know, start start to take priority over the needs for roadways, and it's something that the roadway industry is very concerned about. And um, with a push for a greener um, legislation for the next transportation authorization, this is very much from a roadway user perspective a threat that we're going to be having to face. Um, we need more people making the case for the need for the highway investment and how massive the needs are. Um, unfortunately, a lot of folks, you know, because um, you're paying at the, at the pump when you're, you're paying for the highway trust fund, um, they aren't physically seeing that connection that I'm paying for the roadways when I fill up my gas tank. And when I, um, it, it's just a really hard situation where every American needs to realize that your roadways aren't free and that it's an investment. And much like you see how much you're paying for your cell phone bill or your cable bill or your electricity, folks aren't seeing that highway um, tax show up in their, in their budgets. And um, over time, we just have to make the case that there's such massive needs in the highway side 
that we cannot be subsidizing massively transit when um, a lot of folks aren't using it every day from my perspective. That's, that's how I feel. I know that's controversial. <laughs> that's okay. Um, you know, we t you talked about the, uh, both the Senate and the House have a framework uh, or a bill that they're both pushing. Um, is the Senate bill more likely to become the framework for passage over the House bill or vice versa? That's a great question. And I think, um, you know, it all depends on if, if Pelosi is going to be pushing this, if she's the one that's aggressively going to push it. I mean, you have to look at McConnell's just said he wants to put his foot on the brakes on the spending. It would seem like if we were to get a big, robust infrastructure investment in one of these uh, COVID packages, it would probably have to come from the House, I'm guessing. Pelosi would have to take up that mantra again that this is a vital. Um, jobs effort. But then again, um, Trump will probably have to be there right alongside her. So I can imagine Speaker Pelosi would be hesitant just to rubber stamp the Senate bill without making a big house mark on it. Um, and since I see if, if this is going to become a priority, I imagine it coming from the House. Um, I think that the House is very much going to want to have some real policy and never goes forward. So I think it would hopefully be something, you know, um, House, but I hope the Senate has some influence on it too, because I don't think we want an extremely um, climate title focused bill. I think we want something that infuses money into the current um, highway program uh, program and and really shores up the current um, programs from the FAST Act. I think it would be more positive. It would be faster if you're not implementing new policies and new programs. We could get the money out the door faster. Um, I, I think the DOTs feel the same way. So uh, to answer your question, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that yet. But all I'll say is, um, I think if we get a big infrastructure package, it's gonna be from a push from the House and the Trump administration at this point in time. So I don't imagine it will just be a rubber stamping of the Senate bill. Okay, that's a good answer. I like it. Uh, that was one of my questions. Um, got another question from uh, one of the webinar participants uh, for Laura. Sorry, everybody seems to wanna to ask you a question today, Laura, but. What, and, and maybe this is a good question to maybe sort of end um, our webinar on. I think it's, and we've talked a lot about it, and there's resources out there that we've made available to everybody that's on this call. And I sure hope everybody takes advantage of it and uh, sends um, those letters to their uh, congressman and senator. What's the absolute best thing we can do right now to push Congress toward investing in infrastructure? And you can all take a shot at that, or Laura, I'll give you first shot if you like it. Sure, thank you. I think that's the perfect question to end this on. Um, absolutely, they need, need to hear directly from constituents, from businesses, um, from the folks who actually would do the work. They need to hear how vitally important it is to your industry, to America, to safety, um, to our entire economy, that this is the recovery package America needs most. Um, I really do think that President Trump is there. Like, I really do think he is. And I think it's always been a campaign messaging thing. But that being said, I think that the folks that have his ear have been bending his ear on this for a very long time and said, you made a lot of promises and now's the time. And I just think we need to make a clear, cohesive message that um, and make it loud and clear that this is the recovery package America needs. And um, we have a real opportunity to do something huge, here. you know, a, a big, huge $2 trillion investment like they were talking about before. That's what we need. That's what America needs. And um, it, it takes every single person who's on this call of taking action today and in a few weeks and in a month, because, you know, I don't know whether it's going to come in a phase four or a phase five or a phase six. I think it all depends on, again, how long this, this pandemic goes on, how long we're locked in, how bad the economy gets, how many more relief packages we need. But there's going to be a time for recovery. And this is the recovery bill, um, investing in our infrastructure in a long way, robust way that creates jobs that, um, you know, really can put a lot of Americans to work and at the same time make our whole commute and life better. So that's what I would say. John, in 2015, when the FAST Act was approved, Congress asked for, for a, a thorough report to be written on the interstate system uh, in terms of what the needs were to be in the future. And that report came out 
in 2018. And it, and it really, I think, the framework for moving forward. It talks about the vision to, to, to build this nationwide transportation system that re really changed life in America, but it's a system that, that is crumbling. Uh, you know, topically, the pavement numbers and the bridge numbers look reasonable, but when you look below that at, at the subsurfaces, at the supports of the bridges, uh, the system is, is in dire straits. Uh, and, and state governments are talking about just sort of keeping, again, topically keeping the system uh, open. Uh, but when they're now being asked to look at the real cost of reconstructing the system, of reconstructing thousands of interchanges that don't meet current standards, uh, and then you look at the need for additional capacity, uh, and, and also to be candid, and also in some urban areas, really right-sizing some of the interstates built in the 50s and 60s that really at an urban level uh, really need to be rethought. Um, th those costs are massive, and, and, and Congress asked for a response, and the response from, from this report was it, it was time to commit to, to really rebuilding that system uh, and building an interstate system that's going to serve the, the, the nation's needs well through the 21st century. Uh, and, and that's bigger than, than perhaps a stimulus package and, and perhaps even the next reauthorization package. But, but that needs to be the message moving forward by the transportation community. Uh, Rocky, can we send uh, that report out with uh, the materials that we're sending to uh, our elected officials? Sure. And, and, and you know, and, and TRIP increasingly is including those messages in a lot of our material. Uh, you know, we, we have a set of state fact sheets that, that have a lot of good talking points. And, and so uh, we certainly uh, look to provide the content for communicating these types of messages. I'm just checking one last time to see here if I've got any other questions. Um, I don't think we do. Um, I want to thank um, the panelists uh, for joining us today. They presented some excellent information. I hope everybody, this is a really a call to action. It's now or never. It's, it's time to get out there and really uh, make ourselves known. Uh, we've got some good information there. You have the links, you have the letter. Uh, when we get uh, this country back open again and your projects are going and we can invite people to your plants, uh, please take that toolkit that we sent out and uh, it's a simple thing to do. I've done it with my local legislator. Uh, he was blown away by what he saw out on the highway when he came out to visit and he was excited to come. Um, he wants to come, they wanna come and see these things. I think we can make more of an impact by inviting them to our projects and to our plants than we can by going to Capitol Hill and knocking on their doors. Uh, and I think that's really sort of the, a paradigm shift that we need to really implement here uh, going forward. Um, anybody else have a comment? Can I add something on that point? That's such a great point because um, I've been on a lot of these tours of, of businesses with members of Congress and they, as you just to reiterate, it is so impactful. It really is. Um, you know, when they get to, you know, see the, the machines you're working with every day, the materials, um, when they get to meet your workers, your employees, when they get a tour of the facility, if you bring them out on a roadway project, all of that is just so eye-opening. You know, put them in a hard hat, put a safety vest on them, get pictures and promote it on social, and then they'll promote it on their social media. So I would just say there's so many good things you can do with these visits. And um, it, it's such a way that you become a resource for the member of Congress. And that's exactly what you want to become so that they invite you to their round tables when they talk about transportation. So I would just second that that is such a great way to build a long-term relationship with a member of Congress and really make the case for why they need to invest in our transportation sector. So. I hope everybody is listening to Laura. She knows what she's talking about. She was on Capitol Hill. She worked for a congressman. Um, it makes a difference when you do these things. And I think oftentimes uh, we, we sit back and think, well, it's really not gonna help. It's not gonna matter. I'm not gonna send that letter. Uh, you just heard that it will matter. And so let's take that challenge and take it forward and see what we can do to fix the damn roads once and for all and take care of the funding uh, needs that we have in this country. So seeing no other questions, um, I really want to thank everybody for joining us for 
a really informative hour uh, this afternoon. Um, I know this isn't going to last forever, and you're probably sick and tired of hearing it from everybody else, but we are all in this together, and we will come out of it together. And with that, um, I, thanks, I thank you for your participation and wish you good health uh, going forward. Thanks. Thank you. I just want to remind all our participants, oh. we will be sending um, the recording of this presentation out via email along with all the documents that were um, Laura had mentioned. Um, thank you again to John, Rocky, Laura, and Richard. Um, I think, take care. I think Laura had a, Laura had a comment to make, uh, Allie, if you, I think. I was just saying thank you. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate oh, okay. it. Okay. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Be well. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your participation. Stay safe.